Okay, I'd like you if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Judges, and we're in the seventh chapter. I'm going to read from verse 15 uh, to the end of the chapter, and the title uh, for this morning's uh, meditation really is Faith is the Victory. And so verse 15, it says, And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came onto the the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Bethshitta and Zerath, and to the border of abel Mehola unto Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock, Oreb and Zeb, they slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side, Jordan. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. And I want to just, uh, uh, as we think of this idea of faith is the victory, let me just read a couple of other scriptures that are very pertinent to what we're going to be thinking about today. Uh, one I'm sure you're, you're thinking of already. First John 5 and verses 4 and 5, where it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And it says this, This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? And then just another uh, scripture that, again, is going to have great bearing on our meditations this morning, and that's in Hebrews 11. And I want to read uh, from verse 32, uh, where it says, And what shall I more say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained uh, promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. And then just listen to this phrase, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And so again, just this idea of, through faith, out of weakness, were made strong, put to flight the armies of the aliens. And that's exactly what we see in this portion uh, that's before us. And so we notice that in verse 15, there's been a radical change 
in Gideon. He is no longer possessed of that spirit of fear that and reticence that gripped him uh, previously to this final dream and final encouragement uh, that he overheard uh, in the camp of the Midianites. And so notice in verse 15, it says, it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped, so his first response is to worship. He recognizes God is doing something here. And he just acknowledges uh, this, is, <laughs> this is the Lord's doing. We might say it's marvelous in our eyes. And he worshipped and then he returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. No longer fearful, no longer gripped or paralyzed by fear, but a boldness and a confidence, not in himself, but in the Lord. He knows that the Lord is going to give the victory. And so he now begins to give direction. And remember, a lot of the reticence in the past was uh, he's just a poor farmer, and uh, how could he lead an army? That was a lot of his thinking. How it was, it was self-focused. How could you, God, use a person like me? And it's easy for us to to live in that kind of a mindset where we're uh, we're, we're inwardly focused. We know our weaknesses. We know uh, our lack of abilities in so many ways. And so it's kind of like, well, woe is me. Lord could never use me. And the Lord had to go to incredible lengths to show Gideon, uh, I can use you. I delight to use the weak and foolish things. And Gideon's finally believing God that he is going to be used of him. And uh, the potential that the Lord had seen in Gideon all along is now beginning to be fulfilled. And so notice he takes decisive action. Uh, so notice in verse 16, it says he divided the 300 men into three companies and then he gives them their weapons. He put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And, and so uh, certainly he's a changed man. He's now ready to, to give uh, clear leadership and uh, he, he gives a clear direction. He gives uh, an order. And the strategy that he uses, dividing the, the forces at his disposal into three, has, is going to be used again in Israel. Uh, and it's, what it's going to do, it's going to give the appearance that the Midianites are going to be surrounded on three sides. That's going to be the picture, uh, because he's going to divide them into three groups of 100, and they're all going to go on different sides. One side is going to be left. That's towards the east from where they came. And of course, in the panic, they're going to be forced to go back in that direction. Uh, but notice uh, this, this strategy and how it is going to be used again by Israel. Look at 1 Samuel 11, 1 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 11. We'll see Saul taking the same strategy of dividing his forces. And it says in, in 1 Samuel 11, 11, it was so in the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies and they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch and slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered so that the two of them were not left together. So again, there's three companies dividing your resources uh, to be able to, as it were, surround the enemy on three sides. Uh, 2 Samuel 18, David would again use that same strategy in 2 Samuel 18, verse 2. David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab, a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruah, uh, and Joab's brother, and the third part under the hand of Ittai, the Gittite. And the king said to the people, I'll surely go forth with you myself also, so on and so forth. So again, just get that idea of doing it, allowing him to surround the camp. And uh, we'll, we'll notice that, um, that, that that's going to be the strategy. Uh, <clears throat> notice verse 21, for instance, uh, of chapter 7. It says, they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. So they divide them so that they can surround the camp using these men to maximum effect. 
And of course, we do believe uh, that there's an order in this strategy. He's given an order, but there's going to be an order in the campaign. And again, we, we've, we say this often, but God is a God of order and uh, his work is to be done decently and in order. And so the Lord is definitely using that, uh, ordering the host into three specific groups. And then notice the weaponry that he has, not only the positioning of his men, but the weapons that he has at his disposal. And again, I would think to myself, okay, 300 against 135,000. Okay, humanly speaking, that don't look good. But if we have at least 300 men have, you know, kind of surface to air missiles or, you know, these incredible weapons, well, we can do a lot of damage. But in this instance, the weapons are not what we would typically considered to be great weapons of warfare. And so notice what they are. First of all, there's the pictures that are mentioned. He said, uh, three companies, he put a trumpet in every man's hand em- and with empty pictures and lamps within the pictures. So I want to think about the empty pictures. And so these pictures, uh, they were earthenware jars, basically. And they the purpose of them was to contain the lamp. So they had these lamps and they would cover them with the pictures. And then at the given signal, they would break the pictures so the lamps could be seen. And all of a sudden, you're going to see these 300 lights go on, uh, you know, on each side of the camp, three sides of the camp. And so that was the idea. And, uh, And of course, the pictures themselves, they contained the lamp, but unless they were broken the light couldn't shine out. And I think there's a great picture there. You see, we are clay vessels, the scripture says. That's what we are. That's how the Bible describes us, jars of clay. And in our jars of clay, we have the light. We have the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ that has shined onto us, in us, But oftentimes, people can't see that light unless we're broken. It's the broken vessels that allow the light to shine forth. Uh, F.C. Jennings puts it this way. Man as such is but a poor pitcher, an earthen vessel, and what can God do with such? Break him, that is all. As long as the pitchers were unbroken, they were worse than useless. They only hid the light within them and prevented its outshining. The picture must be smashed. Now, I want to just talk about brokenness just for a moment, because it's something that we resist and we fight against. We don't like brokenness. (laughs) And yet God seems to delight to use broken vessels. And he, and we're going to see a New Testament example and illustration of this. But in a sense, the more broken the vessel, the more bright the light shines through the vessel. And so often it's our unwillingness to submit to God's dealings in our lives and to allow him to to break us. And, And as a result of our resistance, we cease to really shine and be useful for God. So there's the empty picture, there's the trumpet, and of course trumpets were used in Israel as a signal to gather the forces together, to move the camp, uh, to warn of battle, and also for worship uh, over the various offerings. If you want to read about the trumpets, Numbers chapter 10 is a marvelous chapter about the the use of trumpets in Israel. It was, and of course, it wasn't just in Israel. You, uh, prior to walkie-talkies and modern technology, uh, the military uh, had a bugler, and that bugler was the man who gave direction to the military. Right? You got masses of men. Uh, how do you know uh, to uh, to to move forward or you know to advance? How do you know to wield right or wield ref? Well, well, they had tunes and and different trumpet blasts meant different things, and so a trumpet was very important. You know, the New Testament says this that if a trumpet 
gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for battle? <laughs> and we, we believe that uh, the, the trumpet was an audible way of communicating God's mind and God's direction to the people. And of course, it points very clearly to the, the word of God, the, because that's uh, when Paul says, if a trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who prepare himself to battle? He's actually talking about ministry and he's talking about ministry that's clear. That's as clear as the sound of a trumpet uh, that really calls God's people to battle, uh, to serve, to, uh, to live for him, for his glory. And again, if it gives an uncertain sound, well, there's just confusion. And uh, the, the people of God are, are not going to rally to the cause. And then <clears throat> the final piece of equipment is this lamp within the picture. And again, it's interesting. Uh, again, I'm thinking New Testament. We've been thinking a lot about Philippians chapter 2 and how it relates to this particular chapter uh, about doing things without... Um, uh, out of pride or selfish ambition, uh, humility, but also it says uh, that we're to do all things without murmurings and disputings, that we might shine as lights, as luminaries in a dark place. And so this the Midianitish spirit of, of strife, well, that's often seen in murmurings and disputings. And so we need to avoid that Midianite spirit of strife and contention that can mar the testimony of a local assembly and, sh and stop us from shining as lights uh, in a bright place. And so as we put these three things together, we're meant to shine as lights in the darkness. And by the way, the darker the world gets, the brighter the light ought to be. OK, uh, and it's, it's really true. I, I think uh, I'm out in central Florida right now, which is really nice because there's no cities it's out in the country. And last night, walking back from the meeting, pitch black, you could see the, the stars. It was just beautiful. Right. Very dark. And the stars seem to shine, especially bright. I remember one time being out in Arizona in the desert. And that was absolutely marvelous because crystal clear sky. And, and it just the stars were shining brightly. Very dark night, but brilliance of the luminaries in the sky. And so for us, we're supposed to shine brightly as uh, the world gets darker and darker. And of course, what's going to prevent that is if we cease to be broken vessels. Only as we allow the Lord to break us will we really shine. And then we need to give attention to the blowing of the trumpet, the, uh, the clear and certain sound of the word of God. Uh, that, that, that's our rallying cry. That's what we follow. And with those things, a destructive spirit can easily be overcome. And so look at verse 17. It says, he said to them, look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. And so God has raised this man up to be the clear leader of this army of 300 men. And they were to follow the directions of the leader. Remember this enemy, Midian, uh, was a picture of strife and division. Uh, of course, the, the word Midian means strife. And we've been thinking about that a lot. And so often, uh, strife and division <laughs> is is really often directed at leadership. Uh, we think we can do a better job. We, we think we've got better ideas. And it's, it, we don't want to submit uh, to, the, to the authority, to the leaders that God has placed over us. And, and what he's saying here is there was no place for independent action within the ranks. The commands of Gideon had to be obeyed if they were to move forward in harmony. As I do, so do ye also. In other words, follow. And leaders are meant to be in samples to the flock, right? And so uh, that's the idea is that they're supposed to go before and lead and lead by example. We're supposed to follow their example. And Hebrews 13, let's just look there. Uh, very, very important instructions to us. Again, if we would be useful for God in these days, 
we, we need to be uh, those that are marked by these qualities. Hebrews 13, verse 17, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. That is unprofitable for you. And so, yes, there's, there's a great need for this. And so we need to be those that uh, certainly submit to leadership. And so he says, look unto me and do likewise. And Paul says something very similar, doesn't he? He says, follow me as I follow Christ. And again, I think that is the perfect example of what leadership ought to be. Follow me as I follow Christ. Unlike the Pharisees. Now, I want you to look at a very interesting scripture scripture in Matthew 23. Matthew 23, just for a moment. I want to read the first three verses. It says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Interesting. Do what they say, but don't do what they do. (laughs) Because they say the right thing, but they don't do it. They don't live up to what they're saying. And that's a challenge, isn't it, for anybody in a leadership capacity who want to be followed, right? Because leaders are followed, their their example is followed. And so um, am I not only saying things with my lips, but living it with my life? Does my life and lips, are they in sync? Are they in harmony? Uh, In other words, am I, I don't want to be like the Pharisees who the Lord had so much uh, disdain for the Pharisees. And the reason was, that although they often, I mean, they were the conservatives of their day, and often what they said was right. The problem was not what they said. The problem was how they lived. And may God help us if we want to be used of the Lord in these dark days that we find ourselves in, and then we need to be authentic, and we need to live that which we speak. And so this is the the battle plan that we have. Now, also, notice verse 18. It says, When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And so <laughs> there, there's to be um, a, a kind of a shattering of the pictures so that the light can shine out. There's to be the blowing of the trumpet. There's to be this unison, this uniform cry, the sword of the Lord of Gideon. And the combination of these things, plus the fact that they're on three sides of the camp, was literally going to send fear into the hearts of the Midianite army, because it gave the impression that there was a a much greater host than there really was. And it would really kind of send shockwaves throughout the camp. One Bible teacher said this, there's not a single Christian in the world who cannot be the bearer of these three elements of testimony for God. How is it then that so few are found? It is, it, is it because that these three principles that God requires are lacking? The trumpet must be sounded, the pitchers must be broken, and the lamp must not be put under a bushel. Now, again, imagine this. If we were those that gave a clear trumpet sound, do you remember the believers in Thessalonica? It says, from you, the word of the Lord has sounded out. <laughs> And the the language is like a trumpet sound. It's gone out like a clear sound so that we don't have to say anything. It's gone out to Macedonia and Achaia. We don't have to say a thing because from you, the word of the Lord has sounded out. So if every Christian was bold to speak out, to give that clear blast of the trumpet, so to speak, if every Christian uh, 
was broken sufficiently so that the bright light could be seen and our lamp was not put under a bushel, then it would make a, a marvelous, marvelous difference in this scene we find ourselves in. And I said I was going to show you how this relates to New Testament uh, truth. And I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, we've looked at this in a previous study, but it's good to be reminded of these connections. And again, I do believe uh, that Paul was had very much had this portion of scripture in Judges 7 in mind when he wrote these verses. It says, in whom, verse 4, the God of this world, I'm sorry, verse 6, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the light has shone into our darkened hearts to give the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And he says this, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. <laughs> clay pots, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Okay, the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And then he talks about how these vessels were broken. Notice he says, verse 8, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. All is bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. And so how those vessels were broken it, with the persecutions, the trials, or all the rest of it bearing in their body, as it were, the, the, the marks of Jesus Christ. And so what we could say is in life, we, there are lots of events in our lives that God can use to, to break us, to produce that brokenness. So the light can shine out through us. And we can, we can do two things. We can either resist that or, or we can embrace that. And it's interesting that when we resist it, uh, what happens is uh, the, the difficulties of life can do two things in our lives. It can either make us bitter or make us better. If we resist it and we hold on to our pride and hold on to uh, you know, our self selfish kind of thinking, uh, and have refused to allow the Lord to break us, we'll really not shine like we should. And we'll become bitter at life's difficulties and trials and all the rest of it. Or we can respond in a humble way and say, Lord, you, you, you're you using this for good in my life to make the light shine brighter through me. And so, again, how we respond to these things is very, very important. So the... This is this is exactly what Paul had in mind. It's only when the vessels were broken that the light could shine out. <clears throat> and so it says, Gideon, verse 19, and the hundred men that were with him came into the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. So it tells us the, the exact timing of this event. It tells us that it's uh, in the middle watch of the night. Now, the Jews they and the Midianites, they divided the night into three watches. And so the night for them began at 6 p.m. And the first watch was 6 to 10 p.m. Okay, the, the middle watch was from 10 to 2 a.m. And then the final watch was from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. And so this, this middle watch, and, and notice that they had just, it just happened, the middle watch. So in other words, it was 10 p.m. when this occurred. And so he says, 
Notice it says, verse 19, Gideon and 300 men that were with him came to the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch. So they just changed the, the night watchman. They changed the guard. One group had done their six to ten shift and were going off. The new group had just come on uh, for the ten to two shift. And that is when the signal was given. And so it says, verse 20, and the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So they, they, they followed to a T Gideon's example and instructions. And so all of a sudden this 300 men, all of a sudden it's pitch black. They've changed watch. They're just getting used to their new position. And suddenly, 300 lights go on. There's an almighty sh uh, smash of these 300 pictures. And then there's this great cry, the sword of the Lord and, and, and of Gideon. And again, the people are absolutely, as we're going to see, utterly gripped with fear. Now, again, I wonder, just wonder about this. John Wesley may well have been thinking about Gideon's army when he made this amazing statement, he says, give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin and love nothing but God. And I will shake the gates of hell. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful statement? 300 men who fear nothing but sin, love nothing but God. And I'll shake the gates of hell. Uh, just a hundred men. Uh, and again, Others say that another time Wesley said the same thing, but instead of saying, I'll shake the gates of hell, he said, I'll give you England, just 100 men. And it doesn't take a lot. Uh, it really doesn't. Remember, when God turned the world upside down, it began with 120 people praying in an upper room. And from that 120, the world, as it then was, was turned upside down. But what it does take is broken vessels that allow the light to shine out and that clearly give a blast of the, the trumpet, a gospel trumpet, as it were, with great clarity. So this surprise attack spread total panic throughout all the camp of Midian because it tells us, verse 21, it says, they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host, the Midianite host, ran and cried and fled. Sheer panic set in among their ranks. And so it says the 300 blew the trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. Now notice who's doing this. The Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. Remember repeatedly uh, the promise was given to Gideon, I have delivered it into thy hand. Into thy hand have God delivered Midian and all the hosts. The Lord has delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Over and over again, he said, I've done it. And so how did the Lord do it? Well, in the midst of the panic, they didn't know where the enemy was coming from. They saw they were surrounded on three sides. And in fear, they grabbed their weapons and started just slashing out at whoever was nearby. And so it tells us, uh, that uh, they, the host ran and cried and fled. The 300 blew the trumpets. The Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shitta in Zerath and to the border of Abel Mehola and Tabath. Now, again, if you look at all those places, you'll see that they, they'd come east. Uh, they come from the east across Jordan and uh, to the west into Israel. And now they were going back the very direction where they had come from. They'd been surrounded on three sides, the north side, the west side, the south side. And they'd only left one possible direction left for them to go. And that was the direction from which they had come. And so they all had to end up going back east from the direction that they had they had originally come. And so verse 23, it says, and the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh 
and pursued after the Midianites. So remember these that had been sent home. Well, now they, they hear what's happening. Maybe even the ones that were fearful heard that the enemy was now destroying one another and, and they wanted to get in the fight. And so the host now rally uh, to this battle. And it is interesting, isn't it? Uh, it? Psalm 110 talks about God's people and it says, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Isn't that interesting? Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And, and oftentimes when God is working in a marvelous way, even with a small group, others want to join in because they, their faith is emboldened by what they're seeing and they want to be in the fight. And so all of a sudden, uh, those of uh, Naphtali and Asher, uh, Manasseh, they pursue after the Midianites. So everybody wants to join in. And it says, and Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. And all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters to Beth Barah and Jordan. And so the Ephraim, who were not called initially, remember I pointed out when we last time that, that, that Gideon had not called the men of Ephraim. Now we're going to uh, hopefully in the next uh, few minutes, we're going to explain why Ephraim were not called. But at this time he calls Ephraim and he asks them particularly to cut off the crossings of Jordan because they're going to have to go across Jordan to get back from where they came. And so if their way of escape can be cut off, then the, the route will be total. So although the battle had been won with 300 men, more were needed now to pursue the Midianites. And as it were, uh, it tells us Gideon is not satisfied with a partial victory. He wanted to see the enemy completely routed. Isn't it good not to be content with a partial victory? Oh, how to walk in victory completely. Uh, that should be our desire to be sanctified wholly in spirit, soul, and body. That's Paul's prayer, right, uh, in Thessalonians 5, verse 23. And we should long for that, Lord. I don't want just a little bit of it. I want to live a life of complete victory. And, and he wanted the enemy to be completely uh, <clears throat> uh, destroyed, not just a partial one. And so those that had been sent back now come back to the battlefield and added to that Ephraim are called into action and particularly with the view of cutting off the crossings of Jordan and it, it seems at first reading that they do it without complaint because it says again the end of verse 24 all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan and they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock, uh, Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, the other side, Jordan. So everything seems to be good at this point. Captured two Midianite princess, prin uh, princes, Oreb and Zeb. Now, kind of interesting, these names, Oreb and Zeb, it gives you a kind of a window as it were, into the enemy camp, right? These are Midianite princes, and their names are Oreb and Zeb. Now, Oreb means a raven, and Zeb means a wolf. So their names kind of give us a picture. Uh, they're unclean, dirty animals, right? Uh, <laughs> unclean birds, unclean animals, a raven and a wolf. The, and they're, they're known for dirt, corruption, and cruelty. And it tells us, this little window of the enemy, the corrupt and cruel nature of our enemy that needs to be overcome in the lives of God's people. And oh, what a, what a cruel taskmaster the evil one really is. Remember the Bible says about him? He's come to steal, kill, 
and destroy. And, and you see those that serve him, and you see the, the misery they're brought into because he's such a cruel, cruel taskmaster. And also he's so unclean. Just as the Lord Jesus, the one who is our Lord and master, is so holy and righteous and pure, the, the evil one is just filthy, a dirty, evil person. And so we get a picture here of what has to be overcome. Interesting that, that Gideon's victory began at, with him at threshing in a wine press. And then remember, he offered his offering on a rock. And that's when the Lord began to say that he was going to deliver the Midianites into his hand. And now the Midianite princes are slain. And where are they slain? Well, Oreb on the rock. And then Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. Now, not the same places, but isn't it just interesting how it all ties up the start and the end? A, a rock and a winepress. Just interesting little details. Although this seemed to be a minor part of the overall victory. There's something about the destruction of Oreb and Zeb that long lived on in the memory of Israel. I want you just to look at a couple of scriptures that would tell us that much later, uh, this, this feat of killing Oreb and Zeb was still very much in the minds of the, the nation of Israel. Look at Psalm 83, a song uh, or Psalm of Asaph. And verse 11 of Psalm 83, it says, Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yea, all the princes as Zeba and Zalmunna. So again, quoting from Judges 7.25, Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb. Look at Isaiah, the prophet, and chapter 10 and verse 26. And again, this incident is going to be brought before us. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 26. It says, And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. So it's even likened to the defeat of Pharaoh Egypt and the defeat of Oreb at the rock as something that was kind of echoing down through the centuries. Don't forget this amazing event, uh, a, a picture of the awesomeness of the Lord's judgment, both on past enemies and in, on future enemies. And so obviously greatly significant. Now, in the remaining few moments, we, we want to just think a little bit about why uh, Gideon had not called Ephraim initially to the battle. Chapter 8 has a series of tests that come to Gideon after an amazing victory over his enemies. And oftentimes... It's after a great victory that we're tested. Often you, you might have experienced great blessing in your service. And, and afterwards, it almost seems like there's a real test that comes. And uh, Saul, he tests us. And actually, in this chapter, uh, eight, there are going to be four tests that Gideon is going to face after victory. And it's interesting that these four tests, he is going to pass three of the four, and he's going to fail at the final hurdle. And the interesting thing is that the three tests, they come from the people of God. They don't come from outside. It's not the Midianites now. It's God's people that are going to be instrumental in testing his servant Gideon. 
And so three of them are going to be from the people of God. The final test that he's going to fail is going to come from within his own heart. Not from anybody else, but from within his own heart. And that test that comes from within is the one he's going to fail. But we'll have to wait for that uh, till next time. But for now, let's think of this first test. It's in verses one through three. We'll just take a minute to read these three verses. It says, The men of Ephraim said to him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest us not, when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites, and they did chide with him sharply? And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. So the men of Ephraim clearly were not happy about the way things had been done. They weren't willing to recognize God's sovereignty in choosing the weak and foolish things to accomplish this great victory. They felt they had been overlooked or passed by. And it's nothing but Ephraim's pride that fuels this dispute. Remember, we've said it again and again, Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride cometh contention. And Ephraim is, is feeling slated. They're feeling kind of offended that they were not called and, and so their pride is causing strife, causing contention. Uh, remember, they've already just defeated Midian, that means strife, uh, externally strife, but now the strife is coming from within, from God's people. And it's never far away from a strife. And so even though they've defeated Midian, strife once again raises its ugly head, but it's amongst the people of God. And why were Ephraim so prideful? Well, let me give you a couple of reasons. First of all, they were Joshua's tribe. The second largest tribe after Judah. How could they possibly be overlooked? Remember, wasn't Joshua the one that had led them into the, to, to the land and, and given the initial victory? How could they not call, could he not call Ephraim? Because, I mean, we're, we're that special tribe of Joshua. And, and we're this after Judah, we're, we're number two in terms of numbers. And sometimes it's hard to accept that the Lord works by whomsoever he wills. And we don't like it when God blesses somebody else and overlooks us. Are we prepared to be overlooked? Right? I mean, God brings revival. Of course, we want to be part of it. But would we get resentful if, if he brings it to another person through another individual or another group than us? Or will we rejoice? Can we rejoice that God is using another brother in ways we would have loved to have been used ourselves? Or is there that spirit of envy within us and think, well, I'm, I'm better than him. I, I'm at least as good as him. How come... God, you're not using me. Can we be like Barnabas and take a back seat and let Saul take the limelight? Very interesting in Acts. Barnabas gets Saul, and it's always Barnabas and Saul, but there comes a point where it's Saul and Barnabas. And Saul certainly is the one who's getting the blessing in the center of the limelight. And Barnabas seems to be happy to take that second place. So when the men of Ephraim should have been thanking Gideon for delivering the nation, they were criticizing him and adding to his burden. The external strife brought about by the Midianite had been overcome, but the men of Ephraim were stirring up strife from within. Now, can you see why he didn't call them initially? Can you imagine when the Lord told them to go home in chapter 7 when he was whittling down the army to 300 men. Can you imagine in verse 
8 of chapter 7, so the people took victuals in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man, to his tent and retained those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. Now, if, if Ephraim felt slighted that they weren't included, how would they have felt when they were told to go home, we don't need you right now? I think Ephraim's pride would have said, we're not going. <laughs> don't you realize who we are? Don't you realize we're Joshua's tribe? You can't fight this battle without us. And so how does he handle this? Very interesting. How do, how do you handle this? You know, it's, it's, sometimes it's harder to win the brethren than it is to fight the enemy. To win over God's people can be very difficult. And so it says, verse 2, he said to them, what have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? So he dealt with them by taking the lowly place. In facing head on what is known as self-importance, he makes much of what they have, have done and he belittles his own work. They had taken two princes and Gideon makes the most of what they have done at the same time minimizing his own work. He practiced a very simple principle, Philippians 2, 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples. Our time is just about gone, but John Nelson Darby uh, was a wonderful example of this. He always spoke of how he admired and envied the gift of, of an evangelist. And he described his own labors in contrast to the evangelist. He said he was just a ewer of wood. That's a Gideon, because remember, Gideon means a ewer, cut it down, a ewer of wood and a drawer, drawer of water. And so he, he would emphasize the work of the event and minimize his own work. David Gooding, again, very brilliant man, all the rest of it. But I remember listening and preaching on 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15. Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. And he would see himself of one of just the many, 10,000 instructors in Christ. And he would say that he always appreciated the evangelists because they were the fathers. He was just one of the instructors. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says this, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So Gideon won the brethren. It's just as important to win the brethren as it is to defeat the enemy. Proverbs 18 verse 19 says a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. In other words, when somebody's offended, it's really, really hard to win them back. And if you've managed to win an offended brother, you've done more than great military exploits. Well, Gideon has already done great military exploits, and he's being tested, and he has succeeded in winning over his brethren, because verse three, at the end of the verse, it says, then their anger was abated towards him when he had said that, and he won the brethren. Well done, Gideon. One test passed, more to follow, but we'll have to wait, Lord willing, till next time to learn about the subsequent tests and how Gideon does while he's being tested. May God encourage our hearts through these thoughts. Amen.